And so here is our uh, case that I wanted us to talk about uh, this evening. And I'm showing this to you in this format because this is what it looks like when I read it the first time. I have to go through and isolate some facts that I think may or may not be relevant. I put my facts in alternating colors so that they will stand out. And so that's what it looks like at first. That's just my first read. And then at some point, I come in and I start to put my rules in green. At some point, all of these rules are not going to be the rules that are relevant to the resolution of this problem, OK? So then I need to go back in and start to determine what is it that is really the rule that the court is really using to resolve this problem, OK? And so for us to be able to determine uh, problems, we have to be able to develop an issue that will solve the problem, OK? So if I get a whole lot of different case briefs in a contracts case that have an issue statement that says whether the defendant breached the contract, that's going to be the same issue for every contracts case. It's not going to solve the problem here. Whether the contract was enforceable, that's not going to solve the problem here. So that is what we have to do. We have to move ourselves into uh, being able to develop a proper issue statement, being able to problem solve. It's going to be that skill that is going to help us to be successful in law school. It's going to help us to be successful on the bar examination. And it's going to help us to be successful lawyers. I use the same analysis skills now. When I get a problem, first thing I do, I go in. And so once I determine what rule is really the rule that is uh, the that surrounding the solving of the problem for the court here, then I start to zero in on that rule. That is the rule that is going to be used to develop my issue statement. OK? So what, what really was the problem here in this case? Anybody? Yes, sir. There was a, uh, an addendum that it seemed like an addendum. <laughs> that they, they signed the contract to use this, or yours further signed the contract that made reference to that five pages, uh, and they said that they had never. OK. Seen it. All right. All right. We're going to come back to that. But so then what the court determined is what? After this, this came back down from the, uh, this came up to the appellate court. The appellate court determined that the lower court did not use the proper analysis. Why? Yes, ma'am. Right. The lower court just left it at, there was a, he, it was good enough for the lower court. Somebody made a mistake. But to solve the problem here, you have to determine, is it a unilateral mistake or if it's a mutual mistake? That's really the crux of the problem, OK? And so when I start to determine that, then my rule is right here. So you start out broadly, the court says. The law is clear that absent fraud, duress, or a mutual mistake, that one having the capacity to understand a written document, who reads it, signs it, or without reading it, or having read it to him, signs it, he's going to be bound by that. So the court says, OK, so let me go back here and see. What did I have? Did I have any fraud? Nope. I didn't have any duress. Nobody held him down and made him do it. And so the court says, well, in my mind, the thing that we need to determine is whether there is a mutual mistake or not. 
So this is where the uh, issue begins to uh, formulate around. Now, some of the uh, case briefs that I got did not have an issue statement at all. So you have to even, you know, because we're not going to be briefing any cases, OK? Um, this is just another class that deals with the skill of analysis. In your other classes, you brief cases. We're, we're all teaching you subjects, using subjects to teach you analysis, OK? That is the most important thing that we need to be doing here. So I am hoping that if you're briefing cases in your other classes, you have to formulate an issue statement for each one of those cases that you're briefing. And so now that I have focused on the rule now that the court is using, I'm going to use that rule. I'm going to use that rule. I, had, I put mine on a chart. I know, you, I get charts for everything. But I put mine on a chart. I put my issue statement up at the top. And it has to be something, it may be a lot of words. I could fix it later. But I got to work on it first. Whether the defendant's mistake is submitting a three-page agreement to the plaintiffs for signature, and thereafter signing the final draft of the agreement that specifically indicated that it was subject to a seven-page document and a five-page document without then reading it constituted a mutual mistake, which would mean there's no assent, that would result in a lack of a meeting of the minds, because that's what that's all about, mutual assent. then excusing the defendants from their obligation under the contract, or was it a unilateral mistake? Which means there is a sin at that point. It, this court's analysis, if you just made a mistake on your own because of your own folly, then there's going to be, the court is going to say that there is a sin, mutual assent. The other party should not be held responsible for your unilateral mistake. And so then the court goes into an analysis of how you determine that. And so then if you have a lot of bullet, uh, or what I saw was a lot of, uh, you have a, just like a paragraph of facts, I don't see how you can isolate any of those facts, how they will stand out to you when it's time to talk about it in class. And so this is, uh, that's my issue statement. Now, I, can, I don't need all of this. I'm putting a lot of this here to explain to you why, you know, whether it's a mutual mistake, this is what that means, or unilateral. You may not need all of this, but now I have my issue statement. This is a mutual mistake, no assent, or a unilateral mistake which means there is a sense. So I'm going to put that up in my top part of my chart. <clears throat> then I'm going to take the left side of my chart, and I'm going to put my rule over on the left side over here. Now see, the first part of that, I'm just, you know, that's, that's a part of the rule here. But it's not the part that's going to be used for the analysis. But I'm just going to put it up there just so I can have it in my mind. OK, and so then the court defines what a unilateral mistake is. And so I'm going to use that to do my analysis now so that I can test this thing and see if it's a unilateral mistake. If not, then that means it's a mutual mistake. And so then. Now that I have uh, done my, uh, my first read of that contract, now I have my uh, definition of a unilateral mistake. Now I'm going to go back and I'm looking for facts that 
are only relevant to the resolution of this problem. All of that stuff, I don't need to waste my time with. And so then I go back, and this is my second read. I'm only picking out the pieces that relate to the parts of the rule. At some point, I begin to see that, you know, it seemed like some people were saying the five pages weren't there, the seven pages weren't there. When you start to go through the facts, you figure out they really were there. And so uh, I can't really deal with, you know, the fact that somebody said they weren't, they weren't, they, when we signed them, it was only three pages. You would think there were only three pages there. So I don't need to deal with all of that. What I want to go back to are the facts that tell me like, like this one. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. The plaintiff needed some help in filling out the loan forms for the loan, for the mortgage on the home. And they used one of the documents, the one that was dated February 14th, the five-page document. So here, I can see right here, the five-page document was there. And so now I begin to see uh, what facts I need. Eventually, uh, it comes to find out the seven-page document was somehow there as well. So I put my facts, I got my facts that I need. So these now are my relevant facts. So you have to read it at least twice. And I know some people don't think they have the time to do that, but this is a skill. You will see that if you take the time to develop this skill, as time goes on, it gets quicker. I could just boom, I boom, boom, boom. I just move right through it because I know what I'm looking for. And so now I'm gonna go through my analysis at this point, because now I have my relevant facts. I have facts that relate to the, uh, the parts of the rule that I need to resolve. So I'm gonna start with number one. Were there acts that led to a supposition of the defendant's assent? And so I am going to now go down the list and pick out those things that would lead the plaintiff to believe that they assented. So like, number one. So this is really number two, so I'm just going back and I'm taking facts out from that I already have, and I'm matching them up to this part only. And so uh, the facts tell us that Ray and Eurice Brothers agreed to changes, and Eurice took a copy of the plans and specifications dated January the 9th, 1951, consisting of seven pages, which were to be used so he took them with him after the first meeting, okay? So, so if he, he, takes, he takes this form with him and he's gonna use it to do what the plaintiff thought was to uh, formulate a formal bid. So he's thinking, okay. So then uh, the uh, defendants agreed that the Ray's, that Mr. Ray's attorney could then draft the final contract. So he comes back and he gives him the, the, the three-page thing and then the plaintiff says, okay, I'm going to have my plaintiff, I'm going to have my attorney to draft the final agreement. So he's like, okay, so that makes the plaintiff think he's all right with this. So then at the meeting now where they're going to sit down and sign the contract that's drafted by the plaintiff's attorney, that document stated that the house will be built strictly in accordance with the seven page plans and the five page specifications. Then after they signed the document, uh, they helped the plaintiff 
to complete the loan documents using the five-page specification. So we know that the contract, at least now, we know the contract and the five-page specifications are there. So at that point, the plaintiff is thinking, OK, well, And then if you go back and look at some of the testimony that was taken, both of the defendants agree that the seven-page plans were present. So uh, th these are all facts then that would lead the plaintiff to believe that the defendants assented. So then Mr. Uh, the plaintiff left a copy of the contract, the seven-page plans, and the five-page specifications. Even if he had not, they had plenty of time at that point to read through this document that says it's subject to a five-page document and a seven-page document. I only have three pages. So I, that means I need to read carefully what's going on here. So if he leaves and he leaves a copy, he, in his mind, he left a copy of everything. So he believed that the defendants assented to that. <clears throat> and then later on, the people from the Building Association called and said that none of them had signed uh, one of the documents. So the defendant goes into his office picks up the document off his desk and signs the back of all of them. So at some point, uh, somehow, all of the documents were there. He had an opportunity to read those documents. A plaintiff would believe that they assented to the terms of that agreement. So then I'm going to move down to my next part. Well, was there acceptance of the terms of the written contract based on those acts or supposition. So yes, the plaintiffs agreed. They signed the contract. And then number three, was there a signing of the written contract by the defendants? Yes. This is not an oral agreement. And so I am using only those facts that are relevant now to the resolution of the problem. I have my problem, my issue in mind. And so now I need to answer my issue statement. <clears throat> and so that's what I'm going to do. Number one, there were no facts establishing that there was any fraud or duress. I'm going straight down the rule. Therefore, the analysis then is going to focus on whether this was a mutual or unilateral mistake. All the elements of the definition of a unilateral mistake are met. Number one, the Hughes brothers' actions amounted to an assent. Yes. The Rays accepted the terms of the written contract. Yes. The Hughes brothers signed the written contract. Yes. As such, all the elements of the definition of a unilateral mistake. So what I am trying to say to you is that this is just how your problems, when you get your transactions, this is exactly how they are going to come. You're going to get all kinds of things about a seven page, five page, this date, that date. You have to go in then and determine what are the client's bu uh, business goals. Now, they may not be stated in direct terms. But it's enough for you to say, OK, what is it that the client is trying to do here? 